Well, it's a great time of year, and uh, like, like Kent just said, you know, a lot of those things that consume our time and consume this, this period of life on our calendar, uh, they just bring so much joy. And so as we kind of go about our lives and our gift shopping and baking and decorating, all of those things, uh, don't, don't miss uh, the, the birth of Christ and the, the story of redemption and and so I, uh, I trust this is a good series for you, and uh, last week we began this series, uh, just the, the wonder and necessity of the manger, kind of again, looking uh, last year at who Christ really came for, and so this year answering the question of what did Christ's birth really achieve for us, and so we'll spend these next weeks together just walking uh, very, very high altitude through uh, we're not walking high altitude, we're flying high altitude through uh, the book of Isaiah. And uh, again, chapters 1 to, to 37 are kind of this, this story of the king. And then chapters 38 to 55 is the, the story of this, this servant. And then chapters 56 to 66 is this, this picture of uh, this conqueror that, that comes. And again, all of these things that Israel was called to do and called to be that they failed in. And so God, looking at that, speaks through this prophet 700 years before Christ comes and says, because you failed in all of these ways, I'm bringing a greater king. I'm bringing a greater servant who will suffer and die and raise again for the sins of his people. Ultimately being this conqueror that, uh, that we await. And all the, the, the imagery in, in the book of Isaiah of, uh, of eternity now, the day coming when uh, all the tears that we've wept will be wiped away, uh, when God will dwell with us, and uh, we will be with him forever. And so it's a beautiful picture for us uh, in the book of Isaiah of all that Christ came to do. And um, there, are, there are other prophecies in, in Micah and in Genesis and in the Psalms, but, but so many of the, the ones that we know uh, from the New Testament, so many of the ones that we sing and are so familiar with come from the book of Isaiah. And so it's very fitting for us to just spend a few weeks walking through that together. So this morning we're looking at the wonder of love. And so again, this idea of wonder, uh, the questions that come to mind of wondering about love, but also just to be captivated by. Uh, and so even a minute ago, we sang this, this, uh, this whole idea of, oh, come, let us adore him. Why? Well, be because of the great love that he's had for us. And so I want you to, to wonder and question, uh, what, does this, what does this look like for us? What does love really look like? But also to be captivated by and be struck by the wonder of uh, Christ's love for us, God's love for us. So love, again, uh, just to define, just so we're all operating from the same place. Uh, we all define love probably very differently. But love is this idea of a profoundly tender, passionate affection for another person. And the truth is that we all long for this. You, you can think back, depending upon how old you are, uh, to different times that you've felt in love, you've experienced love. Uh, children, you've, you've experienced this at the hands of your parents. Grandparents, you've, you've experienced this at the, the hand of your, your, your grandchildren. We all long for this. We all long to be loved in this way. Tenderly, passionately, uh, affection toward us. And the beauty of the gospel is that it answers that question for us. It meets that, that need, this, this deep longing in us to be loved in those ways. But the truth is, that's why we're captivated by the stories that we are. Because of love. These, these stories that have imprinted themselves on our hearts and on our minds. That's why you will go home and watch these love stories for the thousandth time. You know how it ends. It's why your kids watch the, the same movies over and over and over to the point that the things just kind of fall apart. The DVD player stops working, right? VHS tapes, if you still use those, end up just a mess, right? And there's debates over what, what's the greatest love story of all time. Right? Is it Romeo and Juliet? Right? Is it Elizabeth Bennet and Mr. Darcy? Some of you know that story from Pride and Prejudice. Is it Darth Vader and Luke Skywalker? I saw the third picture there. It's hard to see, but we'll come back to that one. Right? Is it Cosette and Marius from Les Miserables? 
Right? These stories that, that, are, that captivate us. They draw us in. We, we want to know. Because that's how we've been wired. By God. Created by God. To, to love. To be loved in those terms. In those ways. That's why we will turn to those. Because in our brokenness. And in our broken relationships. And in our broken experiences. We don't experience that. We don't see that. We don't have that wash over us. And so we turn to these kinds of stories. We turn to what ultimately the Bible holds up for us in this picture of, of sacrificial love. At the end of, well not the end, when, when Cosette and Marius, if you've watched Les Miserables, uh, it's a great, great story, but they're, they're on either side of this gate. And then there's this, this song between the two of them of introducing themselves. They've seen each other, but they don't know who they are. And so this song breaks out. As it did, I'm sure, when you first met your spouse, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, right? You break into the song to introduce yourself. I'm sure many of that was your, your case. I know it was for us. <laughs> right? So he's singing to her and she's singing to him, introducing themselves. And he sings this, this statement of, I am lost. And her response in that moment is, I am found. Right? It's amazing for, for this interaction of, both sides of this, this relationship, both sides experiencing this captivation of love, and he is lost now in his love for her. And for her, she is found now in his love, in her love for him. It's a, be a beautiful picture. But love makes us do crazy things, right? Spend crazy amounts of money on things we would never spend money on. Go crazy places. You know this. You think back to your, kind of, if you're married, the, the time when you were dating and early, early in your relationship and moving on to engagement, right? You do crazy things, say crazy things, write crazy things that, that in the time you think are romantic and poetic and you look back 20 years later and go, <laughs> it's really funny, right? You think of these, these stories of, of engagement and hiding things and pictures and like all of the, the romance. Are we, are, we, we long for these things. But love makes us do crazy things. And love, when, when it's typified and exemplified and, and kind of runs its course, we see it show up in things like sacrifice, heroism, selflessness. It's why people ultimately, why people put on a uniform. Or there's, a, there's a deep love that motivates and propels people toward those kinds of things. You see it in movies like Saving Private Ryan, Big Hero 6, even in Frozen. So parents, go watch that movie with your kids again for the thousandth time today. And look, you can see the story in there of sacrifice, of love. It's even in Harry Potter. This, this picture for us of laying down your life. For your friends. It's a beautiful picture. Beautiful storyline. Again these are the stories that people around us are watching. They, people in your neighborhood. People that you work with. They know these stories. And so it's an easy way to take the beauty of the gospel. The hope of this kind of love. The wonder of, of redemptive love. And speak into that. Because we all long for these stories to be true. But it can also be distorted. When you separate love from what is good and what is beautiful and what is true, I guess really, really dangerous. Obsession and stalking and perversion of all kinds. So the, the gospel tethers us to the, to the center of that as well. It prevents us from ending away from what's good and beautiful and true. But so much of what we know and experience about love doesn't, doesn't really have much in common with what we hear in love songs from the 90s, especially you throw in some R&B and we tend to buy into this narrative that this is what love is and it's a distortion of what it really ends up looking like and what it was ultimately initially supposed to be. But it also gets distorted in how we talk about that, that concept, right? We, we love sunsets, right? And we love chocolate and we love Thai food and we love our spouse. We love God. Like the, the reality is that we, we tend to, to flatten that word in how we use it across the board. In talking about thousands of different things that are categorically alien from each other. 
And yet we use the same language to talk about that. It's the beauty for us of the, new, the language of the New Testament. There's about seven different words that are translated love that have different implications for us as we work our way through the New Testament. We see, ultimately, what the example for us of love looks like in the life, in the death and burial and resurrection of Christ himself. So in John chapter 3, again, this very famous verse that many, many people know, John 3 verse 16 says, for God so loved the world. There's that word. God loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. The same word that then is used in 1 John 4. We love because he first loved us and sent his son to be this wrath absorbing sacrifice for us. What's interesting is the word that's used there in both of those cases and all throughout the New Testament is the word agape. It's the word love, but what's tied into that is this idea of selfless, sacrificial, no matter the cost, no matter what comes, covenant love. That's the beauty for us of what, what God's love for us is. This unbreakable, unshakable, unstealable, unrustable love that God has for us. So no matter what comes, He's in it. Through thick and thin so where we get this idea of covenant love and marriage, that when you stand before each other and you exchange vows and exchange rings, it's this idea that no matter what comes, I'm, I'm in this with you, for you. That's why we, when I do marriage counseling and ultimately do a, a wedding ceremony, it's, it's why I say the vows that you're, you're sharing this morning or this afternoon or whenever it is are not just something you stitch and hang over the fireplace. These are promises that you're making because this day is coming. When you, when you wake up and the, the cancer diagnosis is there, when the finances are gone, when you wake up and go, who, who are you? You don't look anything like you did 30 years ago. No, but I'm in this. No matter what comes. It's the idea of covenant love. That's the love that propels and motivates God's sending of His Son. Of this kind of love. And so, in Isaiah 6 and briefly into chapter 7 this morning, I want you to see that nothing can stand in the way of God's love for us. Nothing. Nothing can stand in the way of God's love for us. And we're going to see that this kind of love, this sanctifying, steadfast, sacrificial love uh, in these uh, chapters this morning. Before we do, I want to read a, a quote. It's by Don Carson. Uh, just retired from being a seminary professor at Trinity, which is our denomination seminary in Chicago. And it's a lengthy one, but, but it's, I think it's important for us on this topic. He wrote a book called The Difficult Doctrine of the Love of God. And in there he says, If people believe in God at all today, the overwhelming majority hold that this God, however he, she, or it may be understood, is a loving being. So even if you don't agree that there is a God of the Bible, there's a God, whatever he or she or it looks like, she, she he or it is loving. Culture will, will, will say that. But that's what makes the task of Christian witness so daunting. For this widely disseminated belief in the love of God is set with increasing frequency in some matrix other than biblical theology. In other words, we, we take this idea and we run with it that now we've separated it from all that the Bible holds up in tension with this, this idea of God's love. And the result is that when informed Christians talk about the love of God, they mean something very different from what is meant in the surrounding culture. So it's, it's like, it'd be, be similar to a trampoline, right? That has a hundred different springs all around it. It's no fun if you go home and take 99 of the springs out and tell the kids, go out and play on the trampoline. Have fun. There's no risk now of you breaking your leg or falling off and landing in a tree. But it's not a trampoline anymore because it only has one spring. And this is the danger in taking this idea of God is love alone and by itself, divorced from everything else that the Bible holds in tension with God's love. God is love. We see that all over the Bible. 1 John 4 makes that case explicitly. And so as we work our way through these verses this morning, I want you to see what holds that love in tension in different aspects of uh, Isaiah 6 and Isaiah 7. 
So first, we're going to land in Isaiah 6, uh, verses 1 to 8. What I want you to see is that the love of God is sanctifying. The love of God is sanctifying. Sanctifying means this process of holiness. It, it sets us apart. It makes us holy. So, what I want you to see in these verses is that, is that our sin cannot stand in the way of God's love. And the, the, the other attribute of God here that, that tethers and anchors God's love here is God's holiness. God's holiness. The truest version of who we are is found in God. Now, everything in our culture says the exact opposite. It's in self-identity. It's in self-performance. It's in self-preservation. It's in self and the Bible holds up for us a very different picture. It says the truest state of who you are, at the core of who you are, is in relation to God himself. God wants us as we are. Not as, as we think we should be. Not once we're cleaned up. Not once we've got it figured out. Not once we're, we've met these goals. No, God wants you as you are. Not as you one day will be. He meets us there, but in that, he promises to change us. He doesn't leave us as we are. And it's a process of change from the inside out, which is, again, very different from everything we're taught in our culture. You want to change everything? Right? It's all about externals. So change everything outside, and it will result in heart change. And that is not true. If you want the externals to change, it begins with heart change. It's a cleaning up of the inside that affects in a cleaning up of the outside. If you have kids, you know this, right? Uh, I won't say which of our kids, maybe all three of them, right? They're, they're young, they're, they're precious, they're soft, and then they have a blowout in their diaper. You're like, oh, great, I get to clean this up, right? And you, you, you're able to look beyond the mess and go, I'm going to do this because of my love for you. Because of my relationship with you. Because you are precious to me. And so you clean. And it's so like I said a minute ago. That love makes us do crazy things. Including that. And it's the same with God's love for us. That it makes him do crazy things. As he expresses his love for us. Look at verses 1 to 8. In Isaiah 6. In the year that King Uzziah died. I saw the Lord. I saw the Lord. Sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. It's the only three-part repetition related to God's attributes in the Bible. Not good, 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 or lovely, lovely, lovely. No, holy, Holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook and the voice of him who called and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, woe is me, for I am lost. I am undone, for I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. So verse 5 is this, this idea there of woe is me. This woe is, is, a, is a statement of judgment. Cursed am I. I'm a broken mess. My mouth utters distortions of truth because my heart is is not right not only that but I live among a people that are the same way right what awaits me is condemnation and judgment woe is me I am literally undone I am broken I am ruined and in the face of God man is revealed for who he really is you are revealed for who you really are when you come face to face with God unholy Broken, sinful, ruined, undone. And ever since the garden, we are prone to hide and cover ourselves with anything and everything that we can imagine. So I ultimately, in verse 8, he responds with this, this call 
Or here, here's the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and whom will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. Right? His, his response there to this question that he's overhearing is not, not a response that's spatial. Of God, in case you didn't know, here I am. No, it's, it's, a, it's a spiritual response. Now, in relation to being undone and broken and being reminded of who he is on his own, apart from the grace of God, he's lost. And so with this response in verse 8 is now, I know who I am. I, I am now no longer undone and ruined and broken. No, here I am. It's a spiritual response, a spiritual awakening that, that says, now I know who I am and whose I am in you, God. It's a similar response to the, the younger brother who, in the parable of the prodigal son, who's there, right, feeding the pigs, starving, and comes to the realization of, of who his father really is, and this, this idea of repentance and running back. And the, the text says, when he came to himself... This response came of repentance. And sandwiched between these two aspects of woe is me, I am lost in verse 5, and here I am, send me in verse 8, is atonement. It's an offering. It's payment for his sin. That's what the word atonement there in verse 7 means. Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt has been taken away. In other words, your sin has been atoned for. Payment has been made. And the idea of payment there goes back to what we, we saw when we were walking through the book of Exodus with the setting up of the, the tabernacle and ultimately the temple in this most holy place on uh, this, this place where, where the sacrifice was made, covering was made, atonement was made at the mercy seat. And that's the, the language that this angel is using when he flies to Isaiah, touches his mouth with this burning coal and says, now atonement has been made. Now forgiveness has been given. And so love draws him out. This love that God has, but yet it's again balanced with holiness. This isn't love just this euphoric sense of, Isaiah, I just love you and come as you are. No, he, he can't come as he is. And that's why atonement must be made. And so love draws him out. Love draws us out from behind the countless things that we tend to hide behind. To be truly known in the most vulnerable of ways. The most vulnerable of moments. As God created us. And that's the beauty of the garden. Is this idea of being created in the image of God. For the glory of God. In perfect harmony and relationship with God. And so atonement and sacrifice. This love that he has restores that relationship all the way back to the garden. Fellowship, again, renewed relationship with God himself. The love of God is sanctifying. Horatius Bonner says that the free pardon of the cross uproots sin and withers all its branches. Only the certainty of love, forgiving love, can do this. Secondly, Chapter 7, verses 1 to 4, we, we see that the love of God is steadfast. So not only is the love of God sanctifying, but it is steadfast. So our, faith, our faithlessness, not faithfulness, but our faithlessness cannot stand in the way of God's love. But what I want you to see here is that God's love is, is tethered and, and held in perfect tension with God's wrath. So God weaves human brokenness ultimately for his own glory. He doesn't hide it, but he uses it for his redemptive purposes and ultimately for his glory. Let me say that again. God doesn't hide the sin, but he uses it for his greater redemptive purposes and for his glory. He is faithful when we are not. That's why God is ultimately steadfast. God's love is ultimately steadfast toward us and for us. It is unbreakable. Again, this idea of covenant love. No matter what comes, God, God declares this to us and over us and for us that no matter what comes, I'm for you. I'm with you. 
It's an amazing picture for us that, that sustains us. Look at verses 1 to 4 in chapter 7. In the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, son of Uzziah, king of Judah, Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Ramalia, the king of Israel, came up to Jerusalem to wage war against it, but could not yet mount an attack against it. When the house of David was told, Syria is in league with Ephraim, the heart of Ahaz and the heart of his people shook as the trees of the forest shake before the wind. And the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out to meet Ahaz, you and Shear Yashub. There's a footnote there if you have one. The word Shear Yashub means a remnant shall return. So Isaiah's son, his name is that. A remnant shall return. So go out with your son at the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway of the washer's field and say to him, be careful, be quiet, do not fear, and do not let your heart be faint because of these two smoldering stumps of firebrands at the fierce anger of Rezin and Syria and the son of Ramalia. You may be wondering, I'm not sure what that has to do with anything. So what's interesting is in verse 1 of chapter 6, this picture that, that Isaiah is brought into the throne room is when? Well, when the king has died. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. It's about 20 years between the end of chapter 6 and chapter 7. We know that because it says in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, son of Uzziah. So now this is Uzziah's grandson. In 2 Chronicles 26, you may want to turn there. There's a lot of detail there about what's going on here. So, Uzziah uh, dies, Jotham reigns for 16 years, and then ultimately his son, Ahaz, takes the throne. So this is in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham. These things are now happening. But just prior to the death of King Uzziah at the end of chapter 5, it's a picture of bleakness. It's a picture that, that starts to set the contrast of, of hopelessness that hope is now going to speak into. Behold, darkness and distress, and the light is darkened by its clouds. Then in the year that King Uzziah died. So in the midst of everything that's been going well, now there's death. Uzziah was a great king, started out great, and then he's now died. And so it may seem like it's hopeless. The earthly security, their earthly king who's ruled them for 52 years is now dead. It may seem hopeless and bleak. And yet God is using it for his glory and for his purposes. So the same is true for us, for, for you this morning. It may seem like whatever situation you're facing as an individual or as a family it may seem hopeless. It may seem bleak. It may seem like God's nowhere in this picture. And yet, He is. It may seem dark right now, but, but God is working in ways that we don't see. And ultimately, while we're not even looking. Love that phrase, but God. God is working. So, a little background on these men and how this reveals God's steadfast love. So ultimately, in chapter 26 of 2 Chronicles, it, it outlines uh, all that Uzziah did. He was a great man, victorious in battle. Verses 14 and 15 in chapter 26, Uzziah prepared for all the army shields and spears and helmets, coats of mail, bows and stones for slinging. In Jerusalem, he made machines invented by skillful men to be on the towers and the corners to shoot arrows and great stones. And his fame spread far, for he was marvelously helped till he was strong. It's an amazing thing that then begins to happen. That Uzziah was an amazing king, successful, victorious, famous, and prideful. And at that moment, that phrase in chapter 26 until he was strong, changes everything. Because then he wanted to, to go into the temple and offer sacrifices, and all of the, the priests, 80 of them, said, well, well, yes, you're the king, 
But you cannot do this. Do not cross this line. And Uzziah said, no, no, you don't know who I am. Get out of my way. And he went in and offered sacrifice anyways. He was angry with the priests. Verse 19 says, he had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And when he became angry with the priests, leprosy broke out on his forehead in the presence of the priests in the house of the Lord by the altar of incense. And Azariah, the chief priest, and all the priests looked at him, and behold, he was leprous in his forehead. And they rushed him out quickly, and he himself hurried to go out, because the Lord had struck him. And the king Uzziah was a leper to the day of his death, and being a leper, lived in a separate house, for he was excluded for the house, from the house of the Lord. And Jotham, his son, was over the king's house, governing the people of the land. So Uzziah was a great king victorious, successful, and then pride crept in and he said, I'm going to do what I want. So God struck him with leprosy. He eventually died under judgment, wasn't even allowed to go into the temple at all. So he was good and became bad. Then Jotham takes the throne. And Jotham ruled for 16 years and began as well good, but eventually became bad allowed idolatry to creep into the the nation, into the people. And then Ahaz, Ahaz takes the throne and things get far worse. To the point that chapter 28 in 2 Chronicles says, in the time of his distress, he became yet more faithless to the Lord. This same king Ahaz. For he sacrificed to the gods of Damascus that had defeated him. And said, because the gods of the kings of Syria helped them, I will sacrifice to them that they may help me. But they were made the ruin of him and all of Israel. The point that he ended up sacrificing his sons to these these false gods. So things go from bad to worse. So in the king, the year that King Uzziah died, right, this time of darkness that now comes upon the people, Isaiah sees God in His holiness, in His splendor, understands redemption, understands mercy and forgiveness. He's experienced that firsthand. And then he's sent with a message to the people through this king of don't fear. Be careful. Be quiet. Don't fear. I know you're shaking as the trees of the forest, but trust God. Take heart in God. And and he doesn't. He turns to these Uh, These other nations takes comfort in them, offers his own children to them. And what's amazing, if you look at the genealogy of Jesus in the beginning of Matthew's gospel, is who's named there? Matthew 1, verses 7 to 9. David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. Solomon, the father of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam, the father of Abijah, and Abijah, the father of Asaph, and Asaph, the father of Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat, the father of Joram, and Joram, the father of Uzziah, and Uzziah, the father of Jotham, and Jotham, the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah, and on it goes. But God doesn't say, you guys are a broken mess. Let's remove you. Let's start over. No, he actually weaves the brokenness into the the storyline and the genealogy of Christ himself. Because ultimately, God's love is steadfast for his people, but ultimately for his own name and for his own glory. We see that in two places. Verse 2 that I read, when the house of David was told Syria is in league with Ephraim. Verse 13, he says the same thing. And here, and he said, hear then, O house of David. But God is committed to his covenant through David to build a dynasty and to build a kingdom for his people. And yes, he uses the brokenness of these sinful men because ultimately it's his covenant with the house of David that continues that promise moving forward. It's not an individual it's not Uzziah, it's not Jotham, it's not Ahaz. It's, it's this all moving forward in the storyline to get us to Christ. 
Lamentations 3 reminds us the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. God's love is steadfast toward us. He uses our sin and brokenness and weaves it through redemption into his story of what he's doing for his name's sake. Francis Chaper says that God loved his enemy so much that he died to save us. Truth be told, when we read that, we would prefer the word them. God loved his enemy so much that he died to save them. No, God loved his enemy so much that he died to save us. It is his steadfast love that weaves all of these things together for our good and for his glory and for the fame of his name. Lastly, the love of God is sacrificial. Verses 10 to 17 So our hopelessness cannot stand in the way of God's love either. So these kings come because they want to battle against God's people. So they they respond in fear. They're shaking like trees. God says, be careful, be quiet. Don't fear. Don't let your heart become faint. What's amazing is how God responds here through the prophet Isaiah to Ahaz back in uh, in, at the end of verse 4. Be, be careful, be quiet, don't fear. Don't let your heart be faint because of these two smoldering stumps. These two kings that have raised themselves to come against you. And he names one of them, right? The, the fierce anger of Rezin and Syria and the son of... He said, and the second one is just simply the son of Ramalia. Now he doesn't even name the king and he does it again later. Um, as if to say, these kings don't last. These kings, these threats that are around you that you think are the end of the world, the end of your existence, that have struck fear into your hearts, they will not last. One of them, I'm not even sure what his name is. He's just simply the son of Romalia. But this love here, again, is, is held in perfect tension with God's sovereignty. So first we saw God's love in tension with holiness, God's, tension, God's love in tension with his wrath, against sin, and then now God's love tethered to his sovereignty. This is all rooted in a plan for ultimately him sending his son to redeem us and ultimately to dwell among us. That's been the plan. The New Testament says, before the foundation of the world, the lamb was slain. So it's, not, it's not something that all of a sudden sin creeps into the picture and God goes, I wonder what we're going to do. No, from... The foundation of the world, the Lamb was slain. Isaiah 53, again, this amazing text, again, embedded in this this middle portion of the storyline of Isaiah, that this servant would come and be crushed for the sins of the people, struck struck and stricken and smitten by God, afflicted and pierced and crushed. But verse 10 in Isaiah 53 says, Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. It was the will of the Lord to crush him. This wasn't plan B. This from the outset. When Adam and Eve first took of the fruit and ate, there was, the plan was already established then. This was the plan from the outset. And so our hopelessness doesn't stand in the way of God's love. Ultimately, this is a plan to dwell among us. We saw that at the end of Isaiah last week. We see it at at Revelation 21, verse 3, that the dwelling place of God is with man. It's amazing it doesn't reverse that. The dwelling place of man is with God. No, John, they are picking up on what Isaiah writes at the end of his, his book, is that the dwelling place of God is with man. It's a beautiful picture for us. But again, it's all rooted in sacrifice. Then we go back to verse 6 of chapter 6. One of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. The, The coal there is symbolic of everything that the Old Testament sacrificial system stands for. The altar... The fire, blood, wrath, 
The sacrifice being burnt whole. Mercy and forgiveness being extended. Reconciliation happening. Atonement. All of that is tied into this image that this seraphim goes and takes some tongs because he can't touch it. Brings it and sears the lips of Isaiah. All pointing to this sacrifice that must be made to atone for the sins of the people. We see the same thing in verse 13 of chapter 6. Although a tenth remain in it, it will be burned again like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains when it is felled. The holy seed is its stump. So this tree, this picture of, of Israel that's going to be cut down, right? these two smoldering stumps that are going to come against it, Assyria and Babylon come and destroy the nation of Israel. And God says, yeah, but the holy seed is in its stump. And Isaiah 53 kind of picks up on this language of, you know, in, the, in this ground, he grew up, you know, out of the ground, like a, a shoot out of the ground. So picks up on the very same language that is there at the beginning of chapter 6 and 7, like a root out of the, the dry ground. He had no former majesty that we should look at him. But ultimately, that's where this, this prophecy comes in the midst of their, their world crumbling. Uzziah is gone. Jotham is gone. Ah- Ahaz is here and he's a mess. He's sacrificing his own kids to false gods. And where is God? So in verse 10 to 17, the Lord spoke to Ahaz. Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be as deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. So he's saying, I'm going to work, Ahaz, in the midst of your sin, not because of you, but actually in spite of you, I'm going to work. And if you want to to test me and ask for a sign, I'll give it to you, as high as heaven, as low as Sheol. Verse 12, but Ahaz said, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. And he said, hear then, O house of David. Is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey when he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. In other words, he's going to be poor. But before the boy knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land whose two kings you dread will be deserted. The Lord will bring upon you and upon your people and upon your father's house house. Such days as have not come since the day Ephraim departed from Judah, the king of Assyria. In other words, everything you know to be true, everything you know around you that's brought you security is crumbling. You've got nothing. You only have this promise that I'm going to give you, that a virgin is going to give birth to a son, and his name will be called Emmanuel. Emmanuel, which means God with us. Is 700 years from this until that comes to fruition. And this language is picked up again in chapter 8, the end of chapter, in verse 8, and then again in verse 10. Take counsel together, but it will come to nothing. Speak a word, but it will not stand, for God is with us. God has made a, a covenant with us. God has planned and prepared and given us this promise that we have great hope But it's all rooted in sacrifice. All of it. This great love that God has for his people must be purchased by death. It must be sacrificial. At the end of Return of the Jedi, Obi-Wan Kenobi tells Luke that Darth Vader is more machine than man. And yet, if you remember the storyline, women, I know you do, Mind. Right, the, there's this battle that's going on between the emperor and, and Luke and Luke is near death and finally Darth Vader picks him up and, and throws him down this shaft sacrifices himself in order to save Luke right? the, the most hardened of all criminals that we can think of in, in movies Darth Vader kind of near the top and yet sacrifices himself to save his son. 
Some of you be like, wait, that's his son? <laughs> you got to watch the movies. What, what motivates that? Well, selfless, sacrificial love. A great song that I love, it's called The Love of Christ is Rich and Free. And the author goes on to say, the love of Christ is rich and free, fixed on his own, eternally. Not hell or heaven can, can separate this love that God has for us in Christ. But all of this ends for, for Isaiah in obedience. He sees God, experiences salvation, and then at the end says, here I am. Send me. So there's something that the, the word motivates us. God's love motivates us and changes us and compels us toward obedience. So we must hear the word and obey, but it's not trust and obey. Right? There's that old song, trust and obey, because there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. No, it's trust and to obey. That changes everything. It's trust that what God has said is true. And when that takes root in your heart and in your life, it will bring about obedience. So trust, have faith and unwavering confidence in the promises of God. It will motivate you toward obedience. You can't help but obey. That's why he responds the way he does. Here, here I am. There may be other. Here I am. Send me. I will take this message to this hardened people because the gospel ultimately motivates him. It's the obedience of faith. And I want you to see that nothing, absolutely nothing can stand in the way of God's love for you. And the beautiful picture for us this holiday season is Christ coming, taking on flesh, dwelling among us, bearing our sin, ultimately so he would lay down his life in this costly sacrifice that was the will of God from the very beginning of time, so that we who by faith cling to that have an unwavering hope and confidence that God is for us. We're going to sing a closing song, so I'll invite the worship team to come, and let me just pray for us in our time. God, we are captivated by your love. God, truth be told, we, we fail to even put into words what that really means. That your love for us is this costly, steadfast, sacrificial love that holds up your own glory, your own love for us in, in perfect tension with so many other things. And at the heart of it is a baby born into a manger to be crushed and killed for us. Give us grace to, to treasure that above all things, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Would you stand with us as we sing about the wonders of his love?
before benediction, Romans 8, 38 and 39. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. May this season remind you of that, that nothing can separate God's love for you in his son. You dismiss. Have a great week.